Hello and welcome everybody. So my name is Stephen Fortuna um, and this is a show where we bring together HR experts to break down <clears throat> some of the most fundamental topics in the HR lexicon, right? In the HR world. Um, and I'm joined here today by four amazing guests. <clears throat> I'll bring them right in. You can see their lovely faces. Um, so with us today, we have Stephen Farber, who is the talent retention Sherpa, uh, Kelly Loudermilk, Loudermilk, who is a talent innovator, Shaylee Rich, who is an HR consultant, and last but not least, Andrew Anderson, who is a team leader at Go Health. <clears throat> so our topic today is behavioral interviewing. Um, and I'm so glad that you guys are all here watching and participating in this panel. Um, let's just jump right in. And I'd love to just get some baseline definitions out. Um, what really is behavioral interviewing? And Andrew, I'd love if you could start us off to answer that question. And in your answer, if you could also include just some examples of questions you might ask in a behavioral interview. Sure. So behavioral interviewing, you know, predominantly is asking more questions of the recruit potentially of what they would do in certain circumstances or how they would react or how they have reacted right so questions that i've asked in the past and and some of my more favorite go-to's or tell me a time that they felt overwhelmed or you know that they've had a lot of pressure put on them to complete a certain project or anything of that nature and and how did they react what did they do how do they get through those those items and those problems that arose? Uh, you know, asking more targeted questions pertaining to how somebody's going to react is going to give you a better idea of their philosophy and their own personal individual culture, uh, which kind of highlights quite a bit more of what they're going to bring to the team. You know, stats and metrics are great, but behaviors and a culture is a lot of times more important. Yeah, that's really interesting. You're, just, you're asking them to identify certain behaviors that they have done in the past or would do in the future. Um, Kelly, I'd love to bring you in next. Um, I mean, is this a style that you would recommend interviewers use and, and kind of like why or why not? So with any type of interview style, whether it's structured or not structured, it has its pros and cons. I think by far behavioral interviewing is one of the most successful ways to really understand the human behind the resume. Mm -hmm. Um, and get that experience because past experiences do predict future behavior in a lot of ways. However, what I care about in some of the questions that I focus on is how are they changing or bringing something different, especially in a learning moment? Because what I did 10 years ago in a role, I would have definitely not done, you know, once I've learned from that, right? So, you know, what did I learn from that? So, I do recommend it as the best practice, but it, it shouldn't be the complete picture. There should be some scenario based questions, some skill based questions, something that keeps it very objective because un, um, untrained managers or recruiters in that sense of behavioral interviewing are going to have a little bit more subjectivity than they should when it comes to just be, uh, you know behavioral interviews. So you want to try to limit that biasy as much as you can and by doing kind of a mix but being more heavily on the per predictive side of behavioral interviewing you're probably going to have a pretty good mix or a pretty good balance that creates that objective viewpoint uh, so that you do get the best hire um, and not just you know checking you know boxes off a list yeah i love it so so definitely use it but don't don't go all in on it right like have the balance mix um steven i'd love to hear your thoughts on that question as well would you yeah, thanks steven and, <laughs> and and why, yeah. why not would you recommend yeah go for it no absolutely a great name by the way um i really would i, I really just want to piggyback on what uh kelly said that it's definitely something that you want to um not go all in on but you definitely want to use it and and what i mean by that is you know you can ask somebody hey what did you do in this specific situation? How did you handle it? And, and you might get an answer that, that that person is trying to create to make you happy. Uh, they might be unintentionally misleading you because they really want that job or something like that. So in that situation, I think it's good to mix in some hypotheticals that would force them to answer from a behavioral standpoint versus a what they would expect. Um, a good example would be, uh, how would you move a light switch from room A to room B? 
you're going to have all kinds of different answers. You might have somebody say, well, it, I don't know how to move a light switch. Let's find somebody to teach us or I'll figure it out. I'll do some research. Or you may even have somebody who's really skeptical say, why are we moving a light switch? Either way, it's a good way to tell you about that person. Are they logical? Are they someone who wants the team's best interests or uh, are they somebody who's going to go about it alone? So, you know, mixing those hypotheticals in, I think, is a good way to keep it an honest and impactful conversation. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably a lot harder to prepare ahead of time and kind of plan some uh, non-hypotheticals, like just using your previous experience. Um, I love, I, I know we both, we've, many of us have used the word subjective so far, right? In, in kind of <clears throat> these type of questions and the answers you might get back. Um, <clears throat> let's dive into that idea a little bit more. How do you avoid, what are some other ways to like avoid being misled, right? Uh, to make sure that you're not just hiring a good storyteller, someone who's good at talking about their experiences, but someone who's really has the skills necessary for the job. Um, Shaylee, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think it's always good to, once they give you their scenario, right, they're gonna explain to you, you can ask a question, how have you handled a disagreement with a manager in the past? And can you tell me what that looks like? They're gonna tell you the situation, and from there, you're going to take it and you're going to say, OK, is that how you would do that moving forward? If the same situation happened, is that how you would do that? You're kind of then taking and you're going to be able to see from there, they're going to tell you a story, right? Well, I think moving forward, here's what I would do. So you're kind of able to differentiate the facts of what happened to a story, what they're telling, and then able to take that and move forward, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, I love it. Love the fo the follow up questions too. Yeah. Does, does anyone else have any other thoughts about like kind of avoiding that subjectivity and protecting yourself as the interviewer from being kind of misled or uh, lied to in a sense? Um, uh, yeah, I'd love, I'd, honestly, I think the way that Shaylee put it was perfect. Um, I think asking them to kind of clarify their answers, especially mm -hmm. bringing them back to something they may have answered earlier in the interview, is going to force them to kind of. If it's a made up story, they're probably going to get tripped up a little bit. But if they're being honest, I think it's a great opportunity to further solidify how they would behave and handle a situation, which is going to give you know, us as the interviewers a lot more tools to work with. Okay, this person's going to be great, or this is the second time they've answered in the affirmative of where I may not necessarily want them, which is a good way to laterally pivot them to another role as well. Yeah, love it. Uh, any, other, any other thoughts before we move on? Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, I mean, this is this one is really hard because you don't really understand if somebody's pulling your leg or not, or if you're being subjective without the experience or the actual training or knowledge base of what you're doing. So if you're newer to HR or interviewing, looking at different resources, figuring out what key indicators are things that should be piquing your interest or piquing like, is that truth or fact or fiction? I really think just practicing as well. I mean, it really comes with just over time, you can listen to certain answers and you can see, oh, they're not directly answering my question. They're giving me the run around or they're not actually being direct in their answer. Or did you hear that kind of vocal change and kind of pause? What does that mean? And you really get into the intentionality behind how they are speaking. And I also think active listening is like the number one thing. And it is also the hardest thing to do in an interview, especially one on one. Because oftentimes we're taking notes. And so you can't actively participate or listen in that interview. And so you're just following a script. But if you're able to just actively listen and know that you may or may not, you know, sway from that script, so to speak, um, you're able to pick up and continue the conversation like Shaylee mentioned, you know, asking those follow up questions, because that's really going to give you more than you realize. And when you get those nuances with that time and experience, you're going to know what's fact or fiction, or even just if your own subjectivity is in it. Uh, so always have two people in an interview, just so one could take notes and you can actively listen, but it will also help you not be as subjective because you're going to have someone to bounce ideas off of after the fact too. And I think that's really key to Kelly, to be able to, after the interview, kind of unpack the differences that you saw, whether you saw 
uh, factor fiction, like you said, in one of their answers and what part of that you were able to differentiate over the rest of the interview is really good, especially as you're learning behavioral interview styles to have another person there will really be helpful. Yeah. And it's a good stretch opportunity for like a coordinator too. So if you're wanting someone, if you're learning, often go in there with the manager, right? So that you can learn. And then if you are the one who is trying to stretch somebody you have internally, have them join you and take notes. It's a really good way to help development of those who are looking to gain more skill sets. Yeah, I love it. These are these are all great insights. And I think we're 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 kind of trying to answer a bigger question here around like, how do you actually tell if somebody answered a question correctly, right? Like, um, and are they are they lying? Did they give a good answer? What does a good answer even mean? Um, I'd love, Andrew, I'd love to bring you back in here a little bit and just hear your thoughts on that. So how, how do you know if somebody answered your question correctly? Because these can, these can be really subjective and, um, and uh, yeah, hard, hard to know how to like score. So what are your thoughts on that? And then well, I, maybe I, I think it's important as well. Go so ahead. I think it's important to have a clear definition of your organization's understanding of what a correct answer is, right? You know, we as the recruiters and we as the HR professionals have kind of an outside the lines visual of the entire operations and kind of what people are looking for. So what I've done in the past and what I actively kind of encourage within my company now is to you know, have other individuals provide me kind of the answers how they would answer, mm -hmm. right? So if if you, you know, the question being, Stephen, uh, Mr. Farber brought up that, uh, you know, give me a time where you were, you led a project and something didn't go right, or you got into a disagreement with a manager, right? How did you handle that? Ask that of your peers, ask that of everybody within your organization and and, and kind of create some type of baseline across everything. And then how do you know if that answer is correct to both Shaley's and Kelly's and kind of everybody's point is you drill down, you ask questions, you ask follow-up questions. And at some point that interview E is either going to get caught off guard by the amount of information you're asking and you're going to really kind of see what, what they do under pressure or they're going to be on it and have the answer. And, and that can kind of gauge whether or not they're, they're being honest and forthright with you. I love that idea of just kind of reverse engineering it. It's like mm -hmm. find some successful employees and ask them and then use their answers as a baseline. I think that's, that's really smart. Steven, um, do you mind if I jump in here yeah, real quick? Please, please. Yeah. Just to Andrew's point, I think um, another way to, to put that is, you know, maybe the goal isn't to make sure that they answer correctly, but to see like in what style they answer, because ultimately we're looking to, um, hire the best fit. So depending on how they answer under pressure, how, you know, how would you act under pressure? We're, we're all capable of acting under pressure, but we may be looking for a specific um, strategy in that regard. And that's, you know, how they answer, that's going to tell us, okay, this person really fits this or they're capable, but not in the way that we would prefer, if that makes sense. So I'm going to jump in a little bit on that because I, I'm hearing, you know, reverse engineering and then, you know, focusing on other things. My biggest concern there is the diversity factor and like hires, like height, like minds, right? Like that is a huge red flag for me as a woman in the workforce when we already have gender, you know, biases there. So I would just say, just to Stephen's point, yes, you can reverse engineer it, especially when you're new. I think that's a really good idea when you are newer, like what Andrew was mentioning. To Stephen's point, it isn't, there's no right or wrong answer. That's the one thing that people forget about behavioral interviewing. It's how they answer it, because you're thinking, how do they go about solving a problem? Are they a go-getter that's going to go after resources, or do I need to hold their hand a little bit? And nobody should ever be 100% matched. That's like the one key mistake all new recruiters make, because they are going to leave a lot sooner than somebody who's like a 70% match. And research has shown when they have that opportunity, they can meet those gaps pretty easily, but it still keeps them in place. And so don't ever just assume somebody is not qualified because they didn't answer a question a very particular way to your liking. It's like, did they think through that like 
a way that makes them more resourceful? Is that something that's trainable or is that like an ego thing that may come into play with the culture? And then that's more of a big red flag, mm -hmm. right? So you're really paying attention to those nuances. But the examples that both Stephen and Andrew gave are really good from when you're newer, but a lot of that experience will come into play over time where you're able to just say, okay, there's no right or wrong answer. I know that, but I'm watching how they think. And mm -hmm. that's what I care about because that tells me if they're going to be successful or not. And I think it's important too, because we've talked about, right, like how do you know if they're being honest or just telling a story? Like, I think that's the hardest part as you're new, like to know. And I think the key for that, at least in my experience, is to focus on the details. I think Andrew touched on it as well to focus on, okay, so let's go back to that. When you had the dispute with your manager, what was it over? You know, like kind of go back to the things that they're mentioning to where, the details are what's going to matter. If they didn't clarify, ask for clarification to where in those full circle answers, you're not losing the things that you're looking for. Like Kelly said, you know, you're not losing. Are they able to walk this through? You know, how did they handle it? Practically, would this work in our organization culturally? You're able to see those things just by clarifying the details. Yeah. Well, just to update really quick, kind of the, the diversity topic that Kelly brings up with, with regards to interviewing and hiring is, you know, the, the baseline of questions is having definitely the understanding of your organization, right? And, and just kind of to add a little clarity to my statement is, you know who you're looking for, you know the role that you're attempting to fill and you know kind of that, that operations and what they're, what they're attempting to kind of fill in, right? So with that knowledge, you can ask those questions, you can kind of have that baseline. But if you are brand new to Kelly's point, and to Steve and Shaylee, absolutely. Like have that understanding of who you're looking for and kind of what their definition of correct is. But behavioral interviewing is about this conversation right mm -hmm. here. It's not about anything else, right? That's why it's behavioral. If we want stats, if we want to look at the, the skill sets, okay, I'm going to put a typewriter in front of you and say, okay, type. Can you type? Can you use Microsoft? Can you do these things? Well, yeah, you can get an answer there, but that doesn't tell you if that person's going to be a good fit or not. Yeah, awesome. I'd, I'd love for us to get really tactical and specific for one second here. I'd love to hear everyone's answers on this question. Um, when you're going into these interviews, um, are you bringing a rubric? Are you bringing, we talked a little bit about note taking. Are you scoring in any way? Just talk, tell us a little bit about what your process is for actually like grading or scoring and then passing on this feedback uh, to the rest of the team. Um, Shaylee, I'd love to start with you and then we can kind of move around uh, if that works. Yeah, so I definitely bring a rubric that should there be other interview people interviewing this candidate, they would all use. So there's no way to get construed or have any bias that way. And the way I see it is like, exceeds expectations, far exceeds expectations, of course, there's always that, meets and then doesn't exceed. So I kind of have it in my experience broad, but I, I do sometimes numbers like one through five, but they're basically all the same, like doesn't exceed expectations, doesn't meet expectations, meets them and then exceeds them to try and just broadly qualify their behavior, right? Like you're judging someone's behavior and answers and experiences and I found the easiest way to do that is kind of a rubric rating scale. Yeah, um, I, anyone else can jump in. Is that something you do as well or do you do things a little bit differently? Um, I'd love to hear that. You go first, Stephen. I saw you <laughs> I saw you move the hand on the mic. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, well, so my role when, when I've participated in these has been um, I, I, supplementary. So as far as the metrics go for the actual behavior interviewing, I usually leave that up to my client and how they want to do that. Um, what I what I provide um, supplementally to that is um, kind of in a style of where is this person's personality falling? Uh, yes, they answered this question. They they were able to resolve this conflict, but how did they go about resolving it? Was a was it a very much to the point? resolution? Were they just focused on getting to the problem and fixing it? Did they gather details first? Um, did they get stuck in analysis paralysis on every single one of these questions? Or were they more of a, I want to make sure that everybody's happy with my decision, that, that it fits this, does it fit that? Um, is my manager happy with that? Um, 
you know, did they include that in their answer or, you know, were they just like, I solved it. I know I was right. Not everybody was very happy with the way it got solved, but I know that it was right and they'll learn eventually. I think kind of being able to determine where this person actually falls, do they care about what the other people thought or were they more, uh, I think Kelly mentioned it, ego driven in that way, because you take that and then add it to how they did on a rubric like Shaylee mentioned, then you have a more complete answer, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Kelly, did you? <laughs> I mean, I think Shaylee's answer for like a newer or more less experienced interviewer, a rubric is going to be the best way for you to track the performance and compare apples to apples, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're interviewing multiple different candidates in even if it's one on one or with a group setting, you have something tangible to look back on because you're not going to remember things after so long, especially when you have like eight hours of interview nonstop. Yeah. So I think that that's really helpful having that there's so many different types of rubrics out there that people can use over time i would say that that's not necessarily going to be the easiest way it's going to add more work on your plate as you get become more experienced because you can kind of i mean when you've been doing it for you know over a decade and i'm sure all of us on the call can agree that like you just kind of know within the first like five minutes if somebody's going to move forward with an offer or not it's pretty crazy how like accurate you can get on that but it's really just making sure that you set up those foundational knowledge base, right? Comparing apples to apples, being objective, making sure that you're tracking that information, right? In case of an EEO, um, you know, type of situation that comes into play or any type of claim of discrimination or whatever, because you have to have that um, for at least three years after that person's interviewed from a compliance standpoint. But beyond that, it's good for you to start out with as you get more experience, you're going to have your own flavor, your own intuition, your own experiences that lend to that. And that's OK. Don't feel like you always have to do it with the rubric. It's the only thing I would add, because I think it's super important, like to Stephen's fact, it is only a piece of the puzzle. We use a lot of different types of methods throughout our interview processes. And that's what I do for a lot of my clients, because there are different pieces of the puzzle that makes a whole picture of a person because you can't, some people don't interview well, they're very direct to the point and they don't give you a lot of context to an answer. And that's okay. I hired those people for customer care and they are some of the most phenomenal customer care people I've ever had. And some of the most like conversational too, which is super weird, but it's just one of those things. It's like, it's just a piece of the puzzle, right? So don't take everything like, Oh, this is how they are all the time. It just gives you that good picture to like put into place with everything else the rubric is just a really good way for you to remember and like keep in mind okay this is what happened this is what i was expecting this is not what happened so really forming shaley's and stevens you know kind of answer is what i would say like merge that together <laughs> and then it will kind of formulate for yourself as you get more experience love it a andrew would you have anything to add to that yeah i uh i really liked what kelly said with regards to kind of there being a bit of a difference when you're one-on-one -on -one versus kind of a panel interview. Mm -hmm. And that for me has always been the difference. If I'm doing a one-on-one -on -one interview, I walk in with their resume and then it's a very conversational interview. I have the questions that for the last 10 years I've been asking, right? And, and I kind of know how to drive that conversation and get what I want. And I take minor notes on the resume and then I fill out a report afterwards. But if it's a panel interview, I make everybody on the panel have a rubric. You know, there are certain questions that I, I want to hear being asked for my employees to the interviewee, and I want to hear the responses and and see because everybody hears something a little different. Right. You know, so the five of us, if we're in an interview, we're all you know, the interviewee can say the same answer and we're all going to hear it a little bit different. So our notes are going to be imperative at that point. So I think it really is very situational if it's a one on one interview for me personally. I like having that conversation. I like going in very minimalist and kind of seeing where it goes and, and understanding where my key points are. But as a panel interview, just to kind of create some sort of cadence throughout that interview, having those rubrics and having kind of that that style for everybody to follow is, is of critical importance. Awesome, really great. Thank you all for, for hopping in on that one. And we do have one last question. Um, and this actually is probably one we should have covered a little bit earlier, but let's get to it now. We've kind of covered like the why and the how to score and uh, what what these questions, what behavioral interviewing really is. But let's come back one more time to 
the questions themselves and how do, how do you actually pick and create good behavioral interviewing questions? Because I know we've had a lot of examples here of, you know, the lights, moving the light switch, right? That are like very hypothetical, but then there's ones that are very specific around maybe the skills of, of the role you're trying to look at. Um, Shaylee, I'd love to have you start us off and then we can jump back to Andrew and then um, if anyone else wants to chime in after that. Uh, how do you actually, yeah, how do you actually come up with good behavioral interviewing questions? So I think it's been really good to have, right, we've all kind of talked about what our experience has kind of changed um, and how that's changed and developed as we do interviews. So I will say this would be for someone coming in new, trying to figure out how to create these types of interview questions. I think it's listed in our encyclopedia entry as well, the STAR approach, which is what we're probably all familiar with, um, where you want to like take a situation, um, then you want to explain specific tasks that are involved, explain specific actions, and describe results, right? So that's kind of the line that you want to go in that I think we tell all new HR professionals when they're coming into it. That's how you develop these types of questions. Now, as you become more experienced, as we've all said, we kind of just go off of our gut and the conversation. You're able to go in, you ask the question, you're trying to look for something. I view it as a looking glass. You're looking into their past to hear them describe something very clearly because it's they've experienced it to be able to set up their future, right? Like I want to be able to hear how they walked through something to see if they learned anything from it and how they will take that and grow from it in the future. And so that's kind of when I'm asking my questions, that's how I'm thinking to formulate them, right? What was a situation they can walk me through and how they did it? And then how did they grow from it? How did they learn from it? And how would that really benefit my organization one way or another? That's great. Thank you, Shaylee. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew, I'd love to hear from you next. Just what? How do you how do you come up with those behavioral interviewing questions? And I know you sure. said you even have kind of a list of ten that you commonly use, right? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Absolutely. Uh, this kind of goes back to and and we've we've referenced, you know, the the newer HR professional just getting into the role. One of the things very early on in my career that I learned the hard way is that I didn't take the time when I first started to understand what everybody's role was in the organization, right? So if you are brand new and you're walking a role and you have that, that manager come in and say, hey, I need 20 employees, here's, here's the, the bid request and make it happen, mm -hmm. and you don't know what the jobs are, that's a problem, right? So take the time, especially when you're new, first off, to go understand what everybody does, okay? And then as far as my my kind of go to questions, like I said, I, I start I'm very methodical as far as how I start an interview. I ask them to walk through their resume, not read it verbatim. Right. Just tell me what's on your resume. You know, the resume's got them, the resume, in my opinion, got them in the door. It isn't what's going to sell me on hiring them. OK, so but I want them to kind of loosen up. And that's always just kind of a go to here we go, kind of break the break the ice per se. But uh, then based off of that, I, I kind of go in one of two directions. If they're very direct and to the point, I'm going to ask questions like, tell me a time that you failed. Tell me a time that, that you did not succeed at something that you thought you would succeed in. Right. And what happened? Why did it happen? What did we learn from it? If they're a little bit still kind of reserved and not interviewing super well, then I'm going to ask the opposite of that question. Give me a time where you won where you were victorious in a battle, I guess you can say, that you didn't think you would be, right? And using specific verbiage of uh, that has either a positive or a negative connotation will assist you in kind of driving that, that interviewee down the path you want them to go, right? Positive questions are gonna get them to open up a little bit more, where if they're a very direct type A, strong, just like in your face type interviewee, asking the question of, of when they failed, when they've been humbled, right, is going to, have the opposite effect, which is going to kind of slow them down a little bit and get you in control of that interview. So I, I kind of like leading those two those two ways, just depending on who I'm interviewing, and then you know, kind of going down that path. Love it. That's I, I love those examples. Um, uh, Stephen and Kelly, is there anything you'd like to add to to this question? Otherwise, no pressure, right? But anything you'd like to add, Kelly, I'd I'd let you go first if you have something. <laughs> I mean. 
like Shaylee said, having some sort of like guide with lots of different types of behavioral questions is phenomenal for starting out. I have a behavioral interview guide for all of my new managers, for all of my first time people who are interviewing so that they can see different types of behavioral questions, like getting towards a technical behavior or getting towards an adaptive behavior, right? Like really figuring that out. But back to like Andrew's point earlier in the conversation, really understanding what the role is, is really key, as well as what other people need in that team. So I use a lot of different types of assessments in a part of my interview process for a lot of my clients. Well, I can also tell where are certain gaps of what creates a more cohesive team. Do I need a leadership type or a strong A personality? Or do I need someone who's a little bit more collaborative in style to make sure that I have a very balanced approach because neurodiversity is just as important as your regular diversity. And so I approach it that way as well because there are some behaviors and some jobs, especially if they're more mundane jobs, that you have to have no matter what. And that can be any type of personality. But if you can't do this one type of task repetitively and not like bang your head against the wall, you're not going to be successful, right? Whereas maybe there's something that needs more variety, more hopping around. HR department of one is a very popular case of that. You have to be able to mentally flex and change your priority very quickly, very fast. So those are different types of questions you're going to ask. So it's very much based on the position and the behaviors that you need in order to be successful in that position and then backtrack that to say, well, I'm looking for these types of behaviors, what are some questions that I can ask that can help facilitate what those are, they can show me those. And that's kind of how I do it. But you get that from that guide starting out. And then you really understand the roles, like to Andrew's point, and then it evolves from there where you just know it immediately. Like, I know that this role needs this type of behavior. I already know what kind of questions I need to ask because I know the role, I know the manager, I know the vibe, and I know what was going to be successful. And that's, it's just an evolving kind of scenario there. Awesome. Love it. Steven, last thoughts? Yeah, no, that's awesome. I just, um, that, that was, that was beautiful, Kelly. Everybody here has just been beautiful. Um, let me not be awkward. Everybody here has done a great job of explaining this and uh, to, you know, to Kelly's point, which was to Andrew's point, to Shaley's point, to everybody's point here. I think that you got to know what the role is, like you said. Mm -hmm. And when you know what kind of personality you need in that role, if you need a to the point person to make those decisions and whatever it is, then you do have an idea of what those questions are. And if they're not getting answered direct and to the point, then you have an idea that this person may not be that fit. We, we don't know, but it's a good idea. But if you need a more technical, logical person and the questions you're asking are geared to lead towards more details, if you're not getting those details, that's going to tell you a lot about their behavior. But if they are just like, oh, <laughs> of course, and they start giving you a detail, 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 well, you've found your logical person. At least you found a good lead on that. So yes, I think knowing the role and then applying that behavior, are, are they the strong dominant type? Are they are they the group-centered, you know, parody woo type? Um, that is going to be huge on, on, on really directing that. And as a new person, it doesn't take long to start getting a read on people. I think that's something that's very learnable. Um, it shouldn't be something intimidating. You'll know kind of who you're talking to after a couple of questions, and that will tell you where to go from there. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephen, Kelly, Shaylee, Andrew. This has been an awesome conversation. That's all the time we have and all the questions answered that, that we need to answer together. So uh, thank you so much for watching at home. Um, I'm actually going to just show this slide really quickly. If you guys want to learn more about behavioral interviewing, uh, feel free to stop by our HR encyclopedia where we have, <clears throat> in addition to uh, an entry on behavioral interviewing, we have 390 plus right additional entries uh, that'll help you to learn and grow your HR career and also meet the panelists and connect with, with all these four. Um, you can find their profiles uh, on the members page of our HR Mavericks community. So thank you all so much for being involved. Um, we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.